Um, our next speaker this evening, uh, you heard that he's got his, his, uh, he's got an extra title tonight that I made reference to earlier, and I don't know if any of you took advantage of it, but uh, it's a new title, but he's, he's an old friend of the Lion Rock Institute. Um, now, the people who are here in the room from Hong Kong, you all know John Tsang. But we do have a lot of friends that are here for the conference that might not know him, and they might not know what everybody knows about his work, for example, in public education in the United States, and studying architecture, and his black belt in, I believe it's judo? Is it judo or karate? Well, yeah, he's got, you know, just don't mess with him. And fencing, and as an accomplished fencer, and now I believe he still trains fencing, so our financial secretary in Hong Kong is a man of many talents. Um, Hong Kong is still at the number one position in the Economic Freedom Index, and I have no doubt that that is in part due to the efforts of our current financial secretary. He gets it. He also has a very, yes, I think that's worth a round of applause. Yes. You know, he's come up to the Hong Kong bureaucracy, but he, he has that skill of a politician where he comes in and every year we deliver uh, kind of bouquets and brickbats on what we like and what we don't like about current policy in Hong Kong, and he always takes it in stride and always has a response for us. He knows that's what he's going to get, and he comes every time, and we are tremendously appreciative of his willingness to engage in the debate. Now, it is our 10-year anniversary. I don't want to break the tradition, but I am going to go a little bit easier on you than Bill Stacy usually does. He usually delivers this. Um, it's the 10-year anniversary. I won't mention our, our continuing and steadfast opposition to the stamp duties that interfere with the normal function of the real estate market. Because it is our 10-year anniversary and we're going to have a, you know, so I, I definitely won't mention that. But I will, uh, but we, we did confer and we did say that we would like to give the financial secretary credit for, uh, in, in successive budgets, in starting to remove the post-financial crisis measures. In many countries, government said, we will have temporary measures to deal with this financial situation. I know in Canada we had a temporary measure where I come from, it was called income tax and it was introduced to help pay for World War I. <laughs> it's not going anywhere. Number two, um, for the, the projections now are for the Hong Kong government's percentage, Hong Kong government spending as a percentage of, of GDP is projected to go down. He is planning things to head on a downwards trajectory. It started creeping up for a while, but Mr. Tsang has drawn a line and said that it will go down. And for that, we say way to go. Thank you. Part of the mission of Lion Rock is education, is getting the message across, and this financial secretary has been fairly tireless in letting people know that we cannot, just because Hong Kong has money in the bank and runs a surplus, that our long-term demographics are against us, and this city could get into big trouble without discipline. He set up the working group on long-term fiscal planning, and he has consistently stayed on message trying to make sure that people understand that just because we have money today does not mean that we will have unlimited money tomorrow. And for that, we think he's doing a great job. Well done, sir. And, uh, you know, I'm more of the, I'm more of the uh, kind of the moral philosophy end of Lion Rock, but we do have a number of people who are very active in the finance sector, like our chairman, Bill Stacy, uh, Andrew Shun, and, and Simon Lee, one of our founders. And so they were quite keen uh, to give them a, a thumbs up for opening financial markets in China. And uh, today we're in the news for Hong Kong, uh, Shanghai Connect. So keep up the good work on that. Thank you very much. So maybe only a tiny little brick back to go with those bouquets. But as I said, it's our 10 year anniversary. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage the acting chief, uh, the acting CEO of Hong Kong and the financial secretary, Mr. John Song. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm indeed delighted to join you all this evening for the Lion Rock Institute Economic Freedom of the World annual dinner and congratulations on your 10th anniversary. It's always a pleasure for me to speak with people who appreciate the strength of economic freedom, people who understand the importance of free market principles, people like 
Siegfried of the Nauman Institute, people like Fred McMahon of the Fraser Institute, and it's great to uh, have you here again with, with us, Fred. Um, and as you know, uh, Fred runs the Fraser Institute's global, global network, uh, among other things. Indeed, this is an important and opportune moment for me, the financial secretary, or perhaps the acting chief executive of Hong Kong, to thank the Fraser Institute on behalf of the people and the businesses of Hong Kong for bestowing on us again the honor of being the world's freest economy. I'm proud to add that Hong Kong has held the number one rating every year since the Institute's first economic freedom report came out back in 1996. The report tells us what we have done right. It also offers timely and valuable insights into areas on which we need to work harder if we are to reap even more of the benefits that economic freedom can bring to us in Hong Kong. The importance of applying the free market philosophy to the formulation of Hong Kong's economic policies cannot be overemphasized. For us, economic freedom is our core value, the linchpin of our success and the formula of our global competitiveness. Today, amidst increasing interdependence in the globalized world among economies, which in some ways, unfortunately, is driving our decision makers towards a new normal, a new normal with less freedom and actually more regulation. And the less competitive economies of the world are urging multinational organizations to enforce the implementation of hugely burdensome and rather imposing initiatives in the post Lehman era, raising the level of inefficiency for everyone in an effort to equalize the world of competition. And that's why spreading that gospel of economic freedom has become even more important now than ever. Hong Kong is a small and open economy, and we rely heavily on international trade. Inevitably, that reliance makes us susceptible to external shocks. Our steadfast commitment to free market principles has indeed guided us through a variety of challenges and crises over the years. And it does so by enabling market forces to bring about fast and efficient adjustments to our economy, and that's economic freedom at work. It is not an exaggeration to say that economic freedom has been the cornerstone of Hong Kong's economic stability, growth, and prosperity. So what do we mean by economic freedom? And Fred has just mentioned in Fraser Institute's own words, and I quote, personal choice, voluntary exchange, freedom to enter markets and compete, and security of the people and privately owned property, unquote. And these are the essentials of economic freedom. So accordingly, the Institute measures economic freedom in five broad areas, legal system and property rights, regulation, freedom to trade internationally, access to sound money, and size of government. Those elements should be familiar to everyone here familiar because they are in perfect alignment with our own free market principles and governance philosophy. So let me share with you tonight my thoughts on how Hong Kong is faring in these five areas. First, the legal system and property rights, or more broadly speaking, the rule of law, as Fred has just mentioned. This is the foundation of modern society, the key element for the smooth functioning of markets. We do take pride in the fact that the rule of law is established here, firmly established here in Hong Kong, and that it enjoys support throughout the community. The rights and freedoms of all individuals, businesses, and organizations are explicitly guaranteed in our constitutional document, the, private, the basic law. Private property rights, including intellectual property, are well protected here in Hong Kong. These rights have been made possible thanks to our own concerted, concerted efforts in formulating legislation, in law enforcement, as well as in public education. 
Judicial independence is also guaranteed in the face of law. It has been and will always be rigorously upheld. In particular, the judiciary of Hong Kong is free from intervention of any kind by our administration or our legislature. And the basic law provides the clear rules concerning the appointment and removal of judges, as well as the appointment of senior judges from other common law jurisdictions to sit and make judgments on cases in our own court of final appeal. That is something unique that no other jurisdictions have the same kind of arrangement. And the continuing protests I would mention in the past few weeks in Hong Kong have raised some concerns about our rule of law. And so let me take this opportunity to share my views with you. The continuing protests clearly demonstrate that freedom of speech, free freedom of assembly, and other fundamental human rights are well protected here and are protected by the basic law. And we shall uphold the rule of law relentlessly because it represents our core principle and serves the corner, as the cornerstone of Hong Kong's prosperity. Moreover, our local and unfettered media many of them are present here today, have always been a powerful guardian of our rule of law, and they articulate their concerns without fear or favor over any apparent sign of deterioration in this area. As to those who have been challenging the rule of law by charging the code in lines and ignoring the court injunctions in the name of civil disobedience, we shall in our usual way follow the due process in dealing with the individual cases concerned after collecting the necessary evidence. Moving to the second area, which is regulation, which goes hand in hand with the rule of law. Without the rule of law, regulations cannot be effectively enforced, no matter how well deliberated and how business friendly they are. In this regard, I'm pleased to note that the Institute's 2014 report ranked Hong Kong first once again in this area. Hong Kong has always provided a secure and predictable regulatory environment and a level playing field for local and overseas companies alike. We are a faithful practitioner of the nationality neutral principle. We treat everyone, every business, every organization the same way regardless of their nationality. We apply the same rule and the same regulations to everyone alike. We allow everyone to enjoy the same privileges accorded by, for example, our free trade agreements and other international agreements. We operate a true level playing field unlike other jurisdictions in our region. We are continuing to improve our regulatory environment. Under our Be the Smart Regulator program, we promote business efficiency by cutting red tape eliminating outdated and burdensome regulations, enhancing regulatory efficiency and transparency, and reducing business compliance costs. Just let me give you one example. We have designed a one-stop online electronic service for company incorporation and business registration that can actually issue both of these certificates to an applicant in just 15 minutes. This is almost equivalent to the speed of Usain Bolt. <laughs> Our labor market regulations are another example of how carefully we formulate economic policies. The statutory minimum wage, which I believe many of you think here is totally unnecessary, came into effect in May 2011. We have been able to strike a delicate balance here in the implementation of this policy. To date, the policy has been successful in forestalling excessively low wages and also, very importantly, in helping the vulnerable while preserving at the same time Hong Kong's virtually full employment. We may have been fortunate in introducing this policy during an upcycle, if you really think the past few years can be so considered. But we are also mindful of the longer term impact of minimum wage on labor market dynamics, particularly during times of less vibrant economic performance. Now moving on to cross-border trade. 
Even though the benefits of trade have been known since the times of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, protectionism continues to prevail and continues to be a barrier to international trade. Our inability to conclude the Doha round with the implementation of the Bali Agreement, which I think is basically a modest collection of facilitation measures, is a good example of how far some economies will go to obstruct free trade in order to protect their own national interests by leveraging on the welfare of the least developed economies. This is unacceptable and will ultimately damage the credibility as well as the effectiveness of the WTO, which is now the only multilateral trade organization left. To this end, I can proudly say that we remain a staunch supporter of free trade and open markets. A free port, Hong Kong imposes no tariff on exports or imports. We do not exercise any form of capital control, and we have no restrictions on the flow of information. And thanks to our institutional strengths and geographical location, Hong Kong has been able to provide an unmatched environment for conducting international business. And that, together with the mainland's rapid development, has enabled us to become a leading trade, business, and services hub. Consider the following. In 2013, our trade in goods and services totaled some 460% of our GDP. And that places among the world's top economies in terms of openness to trade. More than 7,000 overseas companies operate in Hong Kong, and about 4,000 of them use Hong Kong as their regional headquarters or regional offices. And this underlines Hong Kong's high degree of freedom to engage in international trade and our openness to foreign investment. Now on to sound money. We have fared less well in this area of assessment given the criteria that the Institute has employed and the monetary system that has worked so effectively for us in the last three decades. I don't want to dispute the fine points of this criteria, but I feel that the assessors should give greater consideration to our highly successful monetary system, which has brought a lot of stability to Hong Kong. Under the link exchange rate system, prices and domestic costs in Hong Kong adjust quickly in aligning our macroeconomic conditions with external changes. And this reflects in a positive way our economy's price flexibility, which allows for efficient adjustments in our macro fundamentals to stay in sync with the ebbs and flows of global business. And thanks to our long-standing, transparent, rule-based currency board system, Hong Kong is blessed with one of the world's most consistent and effective monetary policies. And finally, let's look at the size of government. We believe in the efficiency of the private sector. We believe that the government should leave sufficient room in the economy to allow the private sector to flourish. Hong Kong has chosen to limit the size of government in order to accomplish this objective. We believe that by keeping the public sector small, more resources in our community can be taken up by the private sector, the latter being more flexible and has the uncanny ability to allocate these, um, these limited resources in a more efficient manner. Hong Kong has a simple tax system anchored by low tax rates. Our maximum salaries tax is 15%, 1.5, while our profits tax is a flat 16.5%, 1.6. Both among the lowest in the world. A simple low tax regime minimizes decision making distortions made by companies and individuals. It also helps keep compliance and enforcement costs low. Given our commitment to low tax rates, we need to conduct our fiscal policies with prudence. Hong Kong is virtually debt free, with government debt at just one half percent. 0.5% of GDP. The debts issued in recent years under the government bond program are of mind making. I mean, I gotta take responsibility for that. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it would be less than one half percent. But they are not intended for the 
financing of further government spending, but for promoting the development of the local bond market. And we have been able to invest the money raised through the bond issuances and keep them away from the sticky fingers of our legislative councillors. <laughs> Our recurrent government expenditure has remained steady over the past five years at about 13% of GDP, one three. This low level of expenditure reflects in part our determination to maintain rationality and pragmatism in our policies and not fall prey to calls for politically motivated populist measures. We have focused instead on fostering a favorable business environment for Hong Kong, that means creating employment opportunities while providing a social safety net for people who are genuinely in need. The fact that we have been able to maintain full employment in our community, currently at 3.3%, and social welfare spending has continued to account for only a small share of total government expenditure in recent years, are clear signs that our policies are working effectively. Some of you may have noted that our government expenditure related to infrastructure investment has increased in recent years. I believe that infrastructure spending, when used appropriately, represents investment that can reap significant benefits by enhancing Hong Kong's productive capacity in the longer term. It is also a useful tool to stimulate the economy during a slowdown period. It is clearly the result of fiscal prudence and we have the choice, and indeed we have the resources to support such infrastructure spending and to roll out this sort of counter-cyclical measures to stabilize the economy when it becomes necessary. Despite our solid fiscal position, we are not complacent. As mentioned, I set up a working group on long-term fiscal planning last year. Its purpose was to assess the fiscal sustainability given the immense challenges posed by Hong Kong's low fertility rate and aging population. And since the release of the studies report, I have also rolled out a series of expenditure control measures with the aim of re-engineering and reprioritizing government department spending initiatives to help maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of our public service. In short, ladies and gentlemen, our commitment to the free market is Absolute. We value and we take pride in Hong Kong's number one ranking in the Fraser Institute's Economic Freedom Index. Thank you very much. <laughs> we need to sustain and protect the market institutions that have been working effectively in Hong Kong. We need to remain committed to our core values. We need to protect these core values. And there are no shortcuts to developing and maintaining a genuinely free economy. So we are in it for the long haul, rain or shine, for the long-term benefits of the people of Hong Kong. Thank you very much.